It's Friday, November 26. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. The extended state of public emergency will end this weekend. This after government senators failed to get support for the security measure from opposition senators following a debate inside Gordon House on Thursday. At least one vote was needed for the measure to be extended for the next three months. A state of public emergency, SOE, when declared, expands authorities of Jamaican security forces to, among other things, arbitrarily detain and deport suspicious persons, enter premises, and seize property without warrant. Prime Minister Andrew Holness announced on November 14 that SOEs have been declared in St. Andrew South, Kingston West, Kingston Central, and Kingston East in the corporate area, and St. James, Hanover and Westmoreland. The announcement and its passage in the lower house meant the security measure was being extended. We are being treated with contempt when we are told vote for something even though you see you have not been presented with any cogent and persuasive evidence. You have not been had the benefit of the advice of the heads of the security forces. You have not been able to interrogate them um, to test what they're proposing. The amendment to the JCF Act in, in the 90s made it clear commissioner is responsible for operations. The minister is responsible for policy. We are the legislators and the policy makers. They can advise, yes, but it's not their job to decide. It is our job to decide here. They are necessary to give relief to the affected communities and for the security forces to take the actions needed to, ref to return these communities to spaces that can be managed by regular policing. Mr. President, it also bears repeating as it appears to have been missed by some persons in light of the opposition's repeated calls for a plan. Mr. President, there is a plan. And there is more than a plan. There are interconnected plans, programs, policies, and strategies. And perhaps more importantly, there is also action. And the action and investment. The nature of the murder problem that we have, however, is such that it cannot be solved quickly. Use up some of what we try to leave there. DNA. Use up some of what we try to leave there. Ballistics. Use up some of what swab hand. And then use your intelligence to create evidence. But you cannot become a come from little and treat me like I am automatically a criminal. That I am guilty until proven innocent. And then say that that is how the rest are going to feel satisfied. It is not a binary conversation about who is going to stand for the criminal and who is going to stand for the people that die. There is a whole sea in between that. The rest of Westmoreland. The motion was put to a vote and all opposition senators who were present voted against the extension. Government senators needed to get just one vote from the opposition for the two-thirds majority to extend the states of emergency for another three months. The result in the Senate was 13 in favor and three against. Five opposition senators were absent. President of the Senate, Tom Tavares Finson criticized the opposition's decision. In the upshot, three unelected members of this House have voted against this resolution. No account has been taken of the elected representatives from Hanover, St. James, and Westmoreland, all of whom supported the state of emergency. Where is that an expression of democracy? Three unelected, three, not even eight of them, three unelected members of this Senate have put the security of this nation on a knife's edge. With the failure to pass the resolutions in the Senate, the SOEs will have to be abandoned by next Sunday. 
The World Health Organization, the WHO, is holding a special meeting on Friday to discuss a new variant of the coronavirus that has been detected in South Africa. The Technical Advisory Group on the Evolution of COVID-19 was meeting virtually to discuss the so-called B11529 variant that has caused stock markets to swoon and led to the European Union to recommend a pause in flight to southern Africa. Here's the latest update from WHO's COVID-19 technical lead, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove. We don't know very much about this yet. What we do know is that this variant has a large large number of mutations. And the concern is that when you have so many mutations, it can have an impact on how the virus behaves. So right now, researchers are getting together to understand where these mutations are and what that potentially may mean for our diagnostics, our therapeutics, and our vaccines. It's good that they are being detected. It means that we have a system in place. It will take a few weeks for us to understand what impact this variant has. There's a lot of work that is underway. It's a variant that's under monitoring. The TAG VE will discuss if it will become a variant of interest or a variant of concern, and if that's the case, then we will give it a Greek name. But it is something to watch. Everybody that's out there needs to understand that the more this virus circulates, the more opportunities the virus has to change, the more mutations we will see. Every single one of you watching has a role to play in driving transmission down, as well as protecting yourself against severe disease and death. So get vaccinated when you can, make sure you receive the full course of your doses, and make sure you take steps to reduce your exposure and prevent yourself from passing that virus to someone else. Over 1 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Jamaica in the wake of the pandemic. Vaccines are essential to the public health response to the coronavirus, COVID-19. Studies indicate that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks. China recently donated 100,000 doses of the Sinopharm COVID-19 vaccine to Jamaica. More from Marlon Samuels. Jamaica recently acquired 200,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines from the People's Republic of China. Half of the total number of doses was donated. The rest were purchased by the government of Jamaica. The spread of the COVID-19 virus is still ongoing. And we are determined to continue supporting our Jamaican friends within our capacity and sharing our experience and technology. <clears throat> vaccines are the best weapons against the virus. Chinese vaccines have been widely used in the world and proved safe and effective and will surely assist Jamaica's efforts to promote its vaccination program to safeguard the safety and the health of Jamaican people. We know that not only members of the Chinese community in Jamaica have been awaiting their arrival, but certainly Jamaicans as well who value the traditional technology to be used. I wish to say that my team and I are so grateful for the support of our colleagues at the Ministry of Health and Wellness, with whom we have been working assiduously to get to this point. And we're equally appreciative of the efforts of our friends at the Chinese Embassy. Ambassador Tian, you and your team who have stood with us throughout this entire period have certainly can rest assured and know that your efforts have made the difference in providing Jamaicans with an important traditional option for receiving vaccines. The latest shipment of vaccines, as I said, adds to the pool. And I want to again use the platform that I have to encourage Jamaicans to go out and take the vaccine. Uh, we have options, we have quantities, we have inventory, they are properly stored. We have advisors through the medical team, the private sector collaboration, please. That is the most effective response. And just to remind you as I close that you can do so through our website at the Ministry of Health and Wellness, through calling 8881-LOVE or 663-5683, that's 888-663-5683, or through uh, visiting any health center, any health facility, and getting the information uh, that you require. The government continues to do its part, respecting the rights and opinions of our citizens, but 
in as much as we can assist the process forward and protect the public health and set an example, as we always do. And as I observe this room, I can say that all our health protocols have been observed. And I can also say that everyone in this room is fully vaccinated. And so it will be for government events that are planned and controlled that persons who are invited must um, establish that they are fully vaccinated. In fact, all public gatherings that are uh, either um, staged by the government or would require the uh, approval and endorsement of the government attendance will be on the basis of being fully vaccinated. Uh, it is important that we do this, that though the government has transitioned its time, resources, and attention to living with COVID, we do not abandon or take our eyes off this threat that COVID still poses. China is a steadfast supporter of Jamaica's COVID relief efforts. China has donated vaccines, mobile units, personal protective equipment, PPE, face masks, and testing kits. For the news on PBCJ, I am Marlon Samuels. Some public school educators are set to receive electronic vouchers to purchase laptop computers in December under the Education Ministry's Laptop for Teachers program. The program is being developed by eLearning Jamaica Limited. Project manager for the Own Your Own Device initiative at eLearning Jamaica, Seymour Roden, told JIS News that teachers will receive the e-voucher via email or SMS text messages, which can be used at an approved vendor location to purchase a laptop. Mr. Roden informed that the list of teachers slated to benefit under the initiative will be provided by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information and via the Own Your Own device system. Time now for an extended business report where Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Audley Shaw, sheds light on the Priority Investment Project initiative. We have this story plus the usual financial market updates with Gabriel Thompson. In October, the government launched the Priority Investment Project Initiative. Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce Audley Shaw says it will increase the facilitation of private investment projects and have a great economic impact, encourage innovation, engage the local business community and boost the island's development. Speaking last Wednesday during the Jamaica Promotions Jampro Virtual Investment Conference, the minister lauded the initiative, saying it will encourage investments that are in Jamaica's best interests and align with the island's economic and social development goals. Projects will be assessed by Jampro and recommendations made to Cabinet. If approved, they will be selected and noted as being of national interest. When approved, they will be designated priority by the government of Jamaica, which means they are expected to have a strategic impact on sustainable development by contrib contributing to the growth of the economy and increasing the competitiveness of Jamaica, both regionally and globally. The industry minister noted that projects must meet mandatory criteria of adhering to national obligation for social development and should have elements of environmental protection and sustainable development as well as confirmation of financial capability. Once these mandatory criteria are met, the project will be evaluated and scored in five areas, namely economic impact, which includes a minimum capital expenditure of US $300 million or creation of a minimum of 1,200 permanent local jobs. Innovation, linkages, use of local resources and suppliers, very important, local uh, raw materials. Investment in internationally competitive industries and local economic development impact. If all these conditions are met and the project is approved by Cabinet, the investor will receive non-fiscal benefits. Once the minimum score is met and the project is approved by Cabinet, the investment project 
will be expedited through government services and support while addressing the challenges that potential investors may face during the project cycle. The Industry and Commerce Minister's praise for the project comes as government is in the final stages of approving a green investment strategy to address areas of sustainable development across the island. Minister Shaw has noted that the manufacturing, energy and agriculture sectors are moving towards more sustainable investments and projects, saying these will help Jamaica meet its 2030 development goals in innovative ways. Jampro's Explore Do Business Jamaica Virtual Investment Conference 2021 was held on November 17 and 18. For the business report inside the news on PBCJ, I'm Gabrielle Thompson. In foreign exchange trading for Thursday, November 25, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $156.55. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $124.71. The pound sterling traded for $208.11, and the euro sold for an average $179.10. In Thursday's trading session, the JSE Combined Index declined by 1,940 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 94 stocks, of which 37 advanced, 47 declined, and 10 traded firm. The Junior Market Index declined by 12 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, Caribbean Cement Company Limited, and Carreras Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Trading firm were Blue Par Group Limited, Elite Diagnostic Limited, and First Rock Capital Holdings Limited USD. Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited was the volume leader with over 6 million units, followed by Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 2.4 million units, and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 2 million units. In market data for oil prices slid more than 1% on Friday on concerns that a global supply surplus could swell in the first quarter following a coordinated release of crude reserves among major consumers led by the United States. Brent crude futures extended declines for a third session, falling 96 cents or 1.2 percent to $81.26 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate Crude was down $1.35 or 1.7 percent at $77.04 a barrel. And with that, we close this extended edition of the Business Report inside the news on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Pleasant viewing. In regional news, though new COVID-19 infections in the Bahamas are down, Prime Minister Philip Davies is urging residents to remain on guard this holiday season. The Prime Minister, who made an unexpected appearance at the weekly OPM press briefing, acknowledged that gatherings are likely. Jasmine Brown has the details. The Prime Minister says the fact of the matter is the Bahamas is doing well when it comes to keeping COVID-19 numbers down. However, he also insists it's not the time for Bahamians to let their guards down. Starting today with Thanksgiving, gatherings are, are likely to be larger and wanting to remind our people that the pandemic is still alive and it is well. And though we are satisfied with the progress we've been making to date in, in lowering the positivity rate, positivity rate, I'm still urging our people to stay safe. The latest COVID numbers reported by the Ministry of Health showed that 50 new cases were reported on November 23rd. Nine of those cases had a recent history of travel. Hospitalizations were also down to 16. Just two months ago, daily cases on some days exceeded 100 and hospitalizations were in the triple digits. Davis pleaded with residents to remain vigilant. Where possible, avoid large gatherings. Continue to wear your masks particularly if you are indoors in close quarters and if possible if you're going to have gatherings kindly have them on the outside
The weather is great and fine. We have beautiful weather. Gatherings are encouraged to be held outdoors. And when you are indoors, please, if you can, ensure that the place in which you are indoors is properly ventilated. On Wednesday, Director of the National HIV AIDS and Infectious Disease Program, Dr. Nakia Forbes, said the third wave of COVID-19 infections in the Bahamas is basically at an end. This as the Prime Minister urged people to get vaccinated. It's not mandatory, but we have an abundance now of vaccinations. And I encourage each and every one of you and those under the sound of my voice, and I invite you as the media to continue to encourage our people to get vaccinated. It is, no doubt, the safest bet and the safest tool to avoid getting sicker if you contract the virus. According to the Ministry of Health, as of November 20th, more than 143,000 people are fully vaccinated. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. In Guyana, violence experienced within people's homes continues to be a sore issue as more than 1,300 reported cases of domestic violence have been recorded this year based on figures tabulated up to the end of October. This figure was revealed by Minister of Human Services and Social Security, Dr. Vintra Passad, during an interview with the newsroom on Thursday. As of the end of October, we had over 1,300 reports of domestic violence and with the impact of the 914 hotline that is utilized through this Ministry of Human Services and its 24-hour accessibility to people, we would have seen an escalation from the time we started to now in the number of reports. We had over 570 reports specific to domestic violence and 430 specific to cases of child abuse. That was the Minister of Human Services and Social Security, Dr. Vinya Prasad. From January to June this year, Commissioner of Police Acting Nigel Hoppy reported that some 896 cases of domestic violence had already been reported. That means from July to October, just four months, there were at least another 404 reported cases of domestic violence. And to add to existing efforts aimed at reducing domestic violence, the Minister said that a new initiative will be launched. Within these 16 days of activism, I'll be launching a very important program called Community Advocates Network. And it says CAN, that's the acronym. And it just brings home forcibly that we as a people need to realize that domestic violence is bigger than any one person, any one entity. And so we need to have that cumulative, cohesive, collective movement towards eradicating domestic violence. This program is meant to ensure that people can be fired up about eliminating the scourge of violence in their communities. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Vishani Raghavir. The renewable energy programs of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission have the potential to incrementally reduce the cost of electricity for users as well as consumers on a Grinlex grid. This as the self generator program and a small scale independent power producers program slowly roll out after being launched earlier this year. Reducing our dependency on fossil fuels toward the generation of electricity can become a reality before the perceived date of 2030. This can be done via the renewable energy programs of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission which have the capability of reducing Canadians electricity bills which have been an issue of major contention recently. Regulatory accountant Jenna Jacob elaborates that this can be possible when the small-scale independent power producers program comes on stream, distributing renewable energy to the grid. And the more renewable energy that is take on, taken on, it would be distributed for every customer in terms of the, post, the customer would get a share of the lower pricing of the renewable charge on the bill every month. Regulatory engineer Davra Bola However, notes that there are some hurdles that have arisen with getting the small IPP program off the ground despite sustainable interest shown. What we would have seen, however, is that uh, to a certain level for that program, there has been a certain level of resistance, which would have uh, caused things to be a little delayed. 
In simple terms, there are some individuals who just want to do what they want. Polar says due to the scope of engineering and guidelines in being granted a license for the small IPPs, its implementation is expected in the first or second quarter of 2022. Unfortunately, you don't follow procedures, no license. So, so that's in, in, in some way a bit of an impasse. But I would not, I, I would still go as far to consider that program successful to this point even though there have been no license given so far because of the aspect that there are quite a few in the pipeline that are very close. Meanwhile, the self-generator program for residential homes and commercial buildings has been much easier to implement, says the regulatory engineer, noting its affordability. Bola says of the one megawatt accumulated capacity for the self-generator program, 334 kilowatts have already been taken, which is inclusive of individuals who are in the process of getting their permits. The regulatory accountant says several financial institutions have been engaged in offering loans towards the renewable energy programs. In terms of benefits, we have um, benefits to the initial self-generator, which is for them to reduce their fuel energy consumption by using the generated energy. Also, there is a, pass a passive income that they can use by um, selling their extra generation to the grid. Finance Minister Gregory Bowen is expected to address the issue of high electricity bills in the budget on Friday. Now on to the pitch with cricket. The top of the batting order failed the West Indies on day four of the first test versus Sri Lanka, while on day five, you saw a vigilant effort from the middle order, but the lower order did not help. Windy's batsmen, Nkuma Bonner and Joshua Da Silva, held off Sri Lanka for long periods on day five in Galley, but inevitably the regional side succumbed to defeat. Bonner and Da Silva battled hard during their morning resistance, carefully picking their shots and generally displaying a level of concentration and application not normally seen from the Windies. With rain looming, the hopes of pulling off a draw was momentarily on the cards, but following the fall of the Silva for 54, Bonner ran out of partners to be left not out on 68. The West Indies were all out for a paltry 160 as Sri Lanka took the win by 187 runs. The much vaunted spin bowling attack of Sri Lanka lived up to its reputation, while the West Indies' preparation for that eventuality needs to be revisited. Meanwhile, West Indies batsman Joshua De Silva says his teammates just need to concentrate for longer periods of time on batting. He was speaking following the team's 187 run defeat at the hands of Sri Lanka in the first test. At Getley, Ken Fuentes of TTT Live has the wicket keep batsman's reaction. De Silva had a knock of 54 as the West Indies, who were at 1.18 for 6, were bowled off for 160 in their second innings. Well, when I got into the wicket, with Bonner. Um, it was just, we had to rebuild, we had to, to think about how we were going to get ourselves out of this bit of a collapse. So we just wanted to bat balls and just at the end of the day, we just wanted both of us to be in the wicket at the end of the day because then we know tomorrow we could always take it to another, another step and try our best to draw the game or even win the game. He adds, the conditions did pose a challenge, but as a team, they need to concentrate more at the crease. I just think the boys, we need to fight, we need to believe in ourselves. Um, nobody but as I said before, nobody goes out there to fail. Everybody's trying their best, so just a bit of application and give yourself some. You would think you have five days, so just just a bit of application is going to do the job. Kent Fuentes, TTT Sports, and that's the news on PBCJ. Thank you so much for viewing.